Here's a place where all of us can be safe. Our stories of transformation can be safe, and all the things we want to research are safe here. This is Safe Space with Cheyenne. I'm really excited you're here, and I hope you stick around for a while, because I've got a lot to show you before I leave Earth. I love you guys. Hello, all my beautiful friends. Today, I have a story that truly makes me rethink a lot of things. And I know that this is my job to go out and research and bring you information back. But one day, I had an email from a man named Samuel Chong that showed up in my inbox and as I started reading it I was completely blown away by what he was wanting to come and talk about today and then he also sent me a PDF of the book of what we're going to be talking about. I really hope I don't screw up the way to say this. I've been practicing. Um, For anybody that wants to Google, I'm going to say the spelling for you. It's T-H-I-A-O-O-U-B-A prophecy. So Tioba prophecy. I think that's the best way I'm going to say it for you. And it is about a gentleman named Michel Desmarquais that was abducted to what we in the book would refer to as a ninth planetary system. If you're still like, oh my gosh, what is going on? Calm down. We are going to go through the Great Pyramids, the true use of them. We're going to really highlight um, their story of Moses and Exodus, um, human energy fields, healing modalities, the effects of color specifically. One that I'm most interested in talking about is the effects of blue light on us and even pink colors. Um, telepathy, I'd like to touch on. I'm a true believer in it, but I always want to hear from the perspective of the book. And of course, Atlantis and Lumeria. We're going to get in many more topics than that, but that's definitely what I wanted to highlight so you can stay tuned with us. Right now, I want to introduce Samuel to everybody and figure out how he came across this book in the first place. So Samuel, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for having me here. Well, to just dive into it, because again, thank you so much for emailing me, give me a copy of this book, and then reminding me it would definitely be better before the interview to read this book. And not only for my personal development, my ever continuing curiosity of, you know, how we come to be humans and what our purpose really is on life. Um, but you really inspired me to read it. I read it and through the busyness of my life in about three days, I'm going to reread it again and... I have to know, how did you come across this in the first place? Well, since I was young, I was always fascinated by space and also the paranormal on Earth. I was thinking if the ETs could come and visit us, they must have advanced technologies, advanced knowledge. They can just tell us what's going on here, the paranormal, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, the Bermuda Triangle, and the stories in the Bible. So in my subconscious mind, I was always looking for books written by ET contactees. So back in 2014, I was searching for such books on the internet, on Amazon specifically, and I found this book. Back then it was titled Abduction to the Ninth Planet. And I, it was selling very expensively on Amazon, so I checked out uh, from a library. And after I read the book, I couldn't put it down, especially after reading the chapter, Who is Christ? I was totally convinced that this has to be the truth, the truth that old people have been wondering about, the stories in the Bible, the inconsistencies um, from what the church organized religions have taught us, and also some of the things that uh, people have always been wondering about, such as the purpose of life, what about suicide, and things like um, the human energy field or us, and, and how the society works, how the politicians um, kind of manipulate how people think uh, certain things and the true dangers on earth. I couldn't uh, believe that I was a person who was able to track on the author and to learn that one thing the author, Michel de Marquet, wasn't allowed to write in a book. I was uh, pretty fortunate in being able to do that. Are you allowed to speak on the things that he told you that he wasn't able to put in the book? Yes, uh, he told me that uh, uh, Tao, the uh, the ET, told him not to reveal it to anyone else. But uh, he well, he gave, he received permission to tell that to me. But he told me not to tell anyone else. But what he didn't say was that I couldn't write an article 
revealing as many clues and, and giving as many hints as possible for people to read it. So that's what I did. And I wrote that article, article and I posted it on my website. So I will link the article below and I will not dig any deeper into the elusive way that you got that information to us. It's another rabbit hole. I would love to dig down and I'm sure my listeners would as well. So I'll move on to that, but remind me to get that article link from you so we can all read through the lines of it. Um, let's see. Okay, so you end up tracking down the author. He wasn't really excited at first from what I was reading from it. Like he wasn't excited to be like contacted in person about it, but eventually like your intentions were pure. And then that is when you were able to translate the book for him. Is that how your relationship evolved? Right. In the very beginning, he was uh, really annoyed at my visit and also the questions that I asked him. He said to me, read the book, read the book, don't more time in his thick French accent. And he wasn't really interested in responding to my questions. Uh, no matter what I tried, uh, he just uh, didn't say anything about that one thing he, he didn't write in the book. Even though I tried to play chess with him and distract him, and he was pretty stubborn on that. Oh. But then, <laughs> yes. you know, I tried. But but two days before I, I was about to depart, he showed me a contract that he signed with a Chinese publisher. And he wanted me to follow it up uh, because he received $2,000 for the royalties or copyright fees. But the publisher never got back to him um, whether the book was published or not. It turned out that he asked me to follow up with the, the publisher, and the publisher told me that they were not going to publish the book because of the censorship in China. And Michelle asked me to find a different publisher. That's how our relationship and uh, developed uh, over the years. And and and, and after I was uh, successful in having it published by a different publisher, he uh, sent me an email and asked me to visit him in person. Um, so that he could tell me face to face what that one thing was that he didn't write in the book. So I should, I do like this part of the story that I heard on a previous interview you did where you explain the almost intellectual and lively background of Michelle. It's not that he was like some NASA scientist or anything like this. He was a very common man from where he was and a lot of the things that he observed or even learned were technically completely out of his wheelhouse. So for him to be able to, as he states in the first part of the book, um, I, I know it reads like science fiction, but I can assure you I could have never made anything like this up in my head, no matter how hard I tried. And I even remember going into the book and realizing this is a normal everyday person, so to speak that had this experience and was able to thank goodness remember and channel through it and give us honestly the most amazing details I've ever seen in an ET experiencer. Um, but I just like to point that out for anybody listening because you're like for me I really put myself in the shoes of Michelle doing this going through this um, not knowing why you were woken up in the middle of the night and you just go and put your clothes on but you have no idea where you're doing it but you're still doing it leaving a note for your wife to not worry, but I'll be back in 10 days and then just walking towards my garden, you know, really just living. Um, the Not to give too much of the book away, even though we're going to dive into it in a minute, but it captivates you in the first chapter because it immediately talks about this parallel universe that he's sucked into. Can you reiterate that or give me your perspective of how you felt when you were first reading it and learned about this parallel universe where time was basically frozen, but there were souls stuck here for a reason tied to like fissures and warps in time? Yeah, when I was reading that part in the very beginning of the book, I was uh, kind of uh, really amazed that another mystery, some one mystery of the paranormal was solved. That's the Bermuda Triangle, where planes, ships, and people uh, got vanished uh, when they were near that area. So he actually gave a different account by describing what it is inside of the parallel universe, where he saw people wearing medieval clothes and people who behaved as savages. And also, by that time, when I was reading that book, I was uh, always into the mysteries and the studies and researches done by David Pilatus. And he did a great research on people who just got vanished in the national parks in the U.S. and Canada. 
And uh, this book, uh, Michel de Marquet's book, explains the reasons and can actually solve a lot of uh, his uh, missing 411 cases uh, that David Pilatus uh, documented. And I think it's a very like interesting way that the ETs try to hide themselves because they use the parallel universe as a hiding place so that people on Earth uh, wouldn't be able to uh, see them or see their activities. And this is probably why a lot of um, the UFOs or UAPs appear in the clustered areas where David Platt is documented um, in, on his uh, famous uh, Missing 411 map because the, the UFOs use the, the parallel universe as a hiding place. So they come in and go out from there. So that's very interesting. It was super interesting. It grasped me immediately, especially when, I mean, you can see the overview of the book that you sent me, but when you see the cliff notes that you're about to go through, you're like, how does all of this actually tie together? And he does truly a wonderful account from when he gets picked up, the exploration of the parallel universe, the ship. Um, the thing that blew my mind in the first part of the chapter was the language that they were talking about, the numbers that were on the ship. And then they were like, oh, we brought this language from our planet. And it, I just remember my mind was like, of course they did. And when they discussed plant and animal life that they brought from other planets, which makes a heck of a lot of sense to me that those, mainly the animals that came through, I was like, that makes so much more sense that they would be of uh, extraterrestrial planetary system instead of native to ours. Did that surprise you as well? That really surprised me, especially the numbers, because if you look at the numbers, some of the people um, write the numbers, like one has one angle and two has two angles and three has three angles. So it's, uh, it's very logical. And also the numbers uh, were brought by them and given to the people on Earth, and, and they actually went to um, Arab, the, the Chinese call them the Arabic numerals, and uh, not the current numbers used by the Arabs, but, but the ancient uh, numbers, number systems. And, and they, they learned it past through India and also to the rest of the world as well. So I think uh, this book explains uh, so many mysteries and where we all came from, and the animals and the plants and the people, especially, I don't know if you were very surprised about the Jewish people. <laughs> it's very interesting. <laughs> Well, actually, I was thinking about that because I grew up on, I think it was like a Disney movie called Prince of Egypt. So it tells the normal story of Moses where the babies get put in the basket and goes down and literally the whole story of Moses, if you know that. And I remember through any of my own research about anything within the Jewish culture, it was always about we're the chosen ones, we're the chosen ones, we're the chosen ones, which would ultimately make me ask the question, why are you chosen and everybody else isn't? Like, why is there superiority to your race and even to, you know, your doctrine? Um, and then as I was reading that, I was like, that makes absolute sense if you think of a spiritual hierarchy in soul evolution as far as if you have these overseers of you, you're going to go and benefit the ones that are technically of a higher spiritually evolution because you don't want them to go down to the earth's people is probably what i would say so the story of them crashing the way that they in their in their book alone um disproved adam and eve being the first people on the earth and describing who they actually were how it came about um, it really blew me away, and I know there's there's a lot of people that are just going to be like, that's poppycock, like it can't be reasoned with, but it actually makes sense to me that they would be the chosen ones based on them already having the DNA of a higher spiritual soul is the best way I could say about it. But yes, it was surprising um, the way that they... In the beginning of the book, it talks about like the way that we're talking about races is the way that they want me to explain it. So they were talking about black and yellow people and the yellow would be um, identified as Polynesian. Was that correct? The, the yellow would be the Chinese and the Asians and yes. the Polynesians originally came from Arima X3, a different planet mm -hmm. who went to um, Lemuria about 250,000 years ago. So those are the ancestors of the Polynesians. 
the yellows are the Asian, the Asiatic people, um, and uh, the blacks first landed in Australia, and the yellows um, southern Myanmar, and there was a separate group of the blacks and who later went to Africa. So that's the story. Um, but back to the Jewish people. Michel de Marquet told me that the Jewish people originally came from the planet Hebra, which was a Category 3 planet. So you can see the differences between a Category 1 planet and a Category 3 planet. So if you know the Old Testament of the Bible, you, you, you're going to know that um, in the past, in the ancient past, um, people used to live probably 800 or 900 years. So I guess... In the very beginning, they had a very long, like long life. Uh, they had longevity, but gradually speaking, because of the different categories of planets and category one on Earth, and so the longevity gradually was reduced to um, was right now. Yeah. I agree with that as well. I thought about that when I was reading through it. There was another thing that you said that just popped up in my mind when you were saying that. Oh, it escapes me, and I wish it wouldn't. All the, like, every sentence and every page just makes you, like, really scratch and turn your head. And again, I mean, like, these books behind me don't even account for all the other research that I do. Like, these are things that I'm continuously learning and going from. But every time a new piece of information comes up, I always, like, it's easy to link it to something. And I'm like, oh, that makes absolute sense. Especially with their DNA being rich for their Category 3 planet, it would be, like, almost like distorting it over time. So the races and the languages that we're talking about today, they, I mean, have been significantly energetically diminished and distorted over time based on the human race. I know what I was going to say. You said that they came from their home planet of Hebra, and they specified in the book that is why their language is called the Hebrew language because it technically originates from their planet. And I was like, that makes so much sense to me too. Yes, I can understand why for us that is so ancient on earth. Another thing I can understand when we're going through um, the blacks originating in Australia for the first time, but then as soon as the society is built up to a certain point, like amazing, horrifying instances happen and as you read the way that they, they describe the destruction of the planet, um, we to this day, because I know people need proof, 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 especially in like an archeological sense, like give me remnants, give me pottery, give me all of these physical proofs that I need. A lot of the civilizations that they talked about that had built up on earth and then have been dismantled, one would be so far down into the earth's crust. There's no way for us to even get to and even interpret that. But the way that they describe the cataclysms, there would be literally no remnants of these civilizations for us to ever be able to archaeologically go through. Do you agree? I agree. And especially this book is so specific that when the asteroid hit Earth, they split into three parts. The first part hit the Red Sea, was now the Red Sea, the second part, the East Timor area, and the third part, the Galapagos Island area. And I went to Galapagos Islands, and I see that uh, it is uh, the result of uh, of a strike uh, from an asteroid. So I think uh, if people really dig into the archaeological evidence, people can still find a lot of uh, um, things that match the accounts of this book, the Obama Prophecy. So I think uh, this book is probably uh, a book that worth a lot of uh, research and, and, and <laughs> reading. That is another thing that I did really appreciate the book is when the story needed to continue, but you could also see that the reader was going to yearn for more knowledge about a certain passage, that the there were editor notes and there were author notes at the, at the bottom where you could go to this website or you could go here. Um, I know the, was it Project Westford, the Needle Project? Yes. You can go look that up on your own, which I didn't even know that existed until this book. So that was another great rabbit hole that I get to go down. But I do love that you, there are things in this book, there are technological advances that we're going to get in and talk about. And you can go research this on your own outside of the book that you're just like, how is this possible? Well, it's possible because this, I think this man really did have this extraterrestrial experience and he channeled this book basically and my favorite 
besides all the great pyramids, Lemuria, Atlantis, is talking about all of the advancements in technology that they have and understanding why us as a society on earth are not able to attain these because of the fact that we're still fighting with each other. And I've noticed every time that we increase in some sort of technological advance, we don't use it in love, we use it in war. So can you talk to me a little bit about the ET warnings about Category one planet and what that is for Earth and what it means compared to a ninth planet. Well, the true dangers on Earth, according to the Theobans, the uh, ETs, are number one, money, number two, politicians, number three, journalists and drugs, number four, religions. And everything evolve, revolves around money. So you see the wars uh, between different countries people don't want wars at all. I mean, except for the military industrial complex and people who sell armories and, and weapons. Mm -hmm. And I think if you really look at uh, what's really going on behind the scenes, you're probably going to know everything is financially and profit driven, even for the um, pharmaceutical drugs and, and the um, uh, energy uh, industry as well. So uh, the book specifically says that uh, hydrogen engine was invented already and it just needs to be commercialized. What it meant was the hydrogen engines that run on water. Water can be split very easily if we can just find the right vibrational frequency so that the uh, covalent bonds between hydrogen and oxygen molecules or atoms can be broken um, very efficiently and effectively by this vibrational frequency. And this is why in the 1970s, uh, Sandy Meyer invented a car that solely ran on water but he was uh, he was uh, gone uh, he was made dis <laughs> to disappear by certain people so i think uh, this book opens our eyes in a way that uh, we can look at things more holistically and to see what's really going on and more importantly this book is a solution solution to the current uh, day problems uh, it's about love and knowledge and also concerted actions through nonviolent resistance, um, as what Gandhi did in India, as uh, what Dr. Martin Luther King preached. Uh, the people have the power, they just need to wake up and to act together using nonviolent ways to, to really have a strike and so that uh, the special interest groups, the financiers would cave into our demands. We, the poor people, would lose very little by having a strike, but they, the rich, the wealthy, they will lose huge because they depend and rely on labor to profit for themselves. Very well put. Okay, let's get into it. Great Pyramids. What is the true use according to... How do I pronounce the extraterrestrial's name that came? T -H nice. Yeah, T-H-I-A, the, the nine-foot-tall... Yeah, the tall Tao, okay. Yeah. So Tao was explaining the Great Pyramids. Yes. And he told Michel de Marquet that the Great Pyramid of Egypt was actually built 17,000 years ago by a very learned and knowledgeable person from Atlantis named Thoth in a nine year period of time using anti gravitational technologies and supersonic vibratory systems to cut the huge stones in a very precise manner. Because he had the knowledge, he was able to align the huge stones perfectly so that the Great Pyramid of Egypt could capture cosmic and terrestrial energies so that users, the ancient pharaohs, could use it to, as, a, as a tool, as an as a energy center to communicate uh, with people on different planets to explore a parallel universe and also to make rain. And uh, they used uh, some kind of a metal plate uh, with uh, different uh, silver alloys and other metals to project the energy into the sky, into the clouds. This is very similar to an experiment done by the University of Reading in the UK, in which they projected what they call the organ energy into the sky, into the clouds, so that rain would fall. That one really caught my eye when I was reading about that. Is it true that they went into the pyramid and meditated in certain chambers to also contact people on other planets through, I mean, I guess you could say telepathy, but what I, the point I want to get across is 
attuning the frequencies to where they align with each other? Yes. Actually, Michelle de Marquet personally witnessed uh, how they were able to use the pyramid. It was not the Great Pyramid of Egypt that Michel de Marquet witnessed. It was a, another pyramid uh, three times as large uh, or two twice as twice bigger uh, on the continent of uh, Lemuria, in which the king and uh, his associate were were concentrating inside of what we would call the king's chamber, the chamber of that pyramid to communicate with people on, on a different planet. And what did they say? I can't really remember. I remember a certain sentence where they brought up Atlantis for the first time. And then with paraphrasing, because I know I won't say it correctly, they were basically like, that didn't work out. Like what? So do you remember what happened from Lemuria to Atlantis? Because I know that they were still highly evolved for their time. But what was the destruction of both of them? Was it the continuous pattern that we find ourselves in today? Well, the destruction of uh, Lemuria uh, was uh, due to an earthquake, a natural disaster. The entire continent sunk, almost sunk, like overnight into the ocean about 14,500 years ago. And for Atlantis, uh, they were actually colonized by the people on Lemuria. And there was a mm -hmm. Caucasian race, race on Atlantis uh, who were not uh, really satisfied at the rules or or not satisfied by the colonizers of uh, Lemuria. So they had their own independent ways of uh, doing certain things. But because of limitations of technology and also because of uh, natural disasters, um, Atlantis didn't evolve uh, as fast or as rapidly as uh, they would have hoped. And uh, But then there are some technologies that were passed on to people on Atlantis from Lemuria um, such as uh, Thoth, uh, who was able to use the technology to build a, a pyramid in Egypt. Uh, but then Atlantis also disappeared because, um, and for reason not explained in the book, and that actually caused a spiritual and material downfall on Earth. People, after the disappearance of Atlantis, became to uh, focus more on the materialistic aspects of their lives. <sighs> Sometimes I just need a breath in between all this processing through my mind. It just, it plays like a film when you talk. So I'm just like, the fact that they say Thoth was a highly learned person. So yes. there's so much information that I, Thoth is honestly one of my favorite things to look up. I've always believed that Egypt was somehow connected to Atlantis and Lemuria, and I never knew why until I got into the teachings of Thoth and even like Ra. Um, I guess I'm thrown off by the fact that they say he's a learned person since he seemed so celestial in all of the work that I've seen about him. Do you have a clarification for me on that? Well, he was a human being for sure, and people used to think uh, that he was kind of like a godlike figure. But uh, because of his uh, spiritual and material knowledge, he was able to lead Egypt into a great civilization, ancient Egypt. And and people really adored him and probably just uh, made him like a god-like um, figure. Mm -hmm. But he was a human being for sure. That was the first time that I had actually seen him in the context of being a human being because all... All of the other work that I've seen is definitely the other way. Um, would you consider him to be like of an enlightenment like Jesus or Buddha? Would it be something like that? Like when you say a very highly evolved learned person? Yes, I would compare him to uh, Christ or Christ for that matter, because he had all the knowledge. I wouldn't, I think he, he was more superior to the Buddha because Buddha had spiritual knowledge, but not necessarily material knowledge to build a great pyramid. Uh, in that sense, uh, I think Thoth, Thoth has uh, more, had more um, material knowledge uh, than, than other people on Earth. Yeah, that still blew my mind. Hmm. So as we're referring the higher evolved learned man of Thoth, um, I really want you to tell me about your experience when you first came across the passage of, you can do Moses or Jesus or both, whatever one really calls to you. Because uh, that one was really a showstopper for me when I heard it as well. 
Yes, maybe I can start with Jesus or Christ. Um, you know, I was a non-believer of Christ um, as written in the Bible because I thought someone just like him, that would not have been possible because of the miracles he performed. And he claimed that to be the Son of God. That really didn't make any sense to me at all. I went to the churches for social gatherings and business connections and developing my personal uh, relationship with um, the churchgoers. I believed none of the preachings and teachings of the pastors. So that I believed that Christ was something that was uh, extraordinary, but not uh, as what was written in the Bible. Because in the Bible, there are so many inconsistencies. For example, there's no record in the Bible, anything about uh, Christ or Jesus performing miracles before the age of 30. And there's no record uh, in the Bible that says uh, that Jesus went to India, even though in the uh, uh, some of the records in India that says Jesus went to India. And, and also, uh, there's a tomb of Jesus uh, Christ in Shingo village, Japan, that I learned from this book, which uh, I later verified. And people can still look up on the internet and to find the tomb of Jesus Christ in Shingo village, Japan. So why there are so many anecdotes or stories about Jesus and Christ that really uh, don't match with what the, the Bible talked about. This book explains that the Bible was later transcribed or um, actually modified or intentionally distorted by the Catholic Church Council meetings afterwards. And it's so specific, it listed four Catholic Church Council meetings that intentionally distorted the original meanings of the ancient scriptures very specific council meetings, the names. And um, it also explains why when Christ uh, saw his mother uh, after he began preaching, he didn't call his mother mother, he called his mother woman. You know, I'm a linguist and I study languages. Because of the special relationship between a mother and a son, it's just impossible. It doesn't make any sense for a son to call his mother woman under that circumstances. But this book explains why because Jesus and Christ are two different beings. Jesus, born out of Virgin Mary, was born from the embryo, put into the uterus of uh, Virgin Mary by the ETs in order for people to believe that someone extraordinary was going to be born that way and in order to fulfill the prophecies. And even though the young Jesus was highly spiritual and highly intelligent, having a very good conversation with the teachers of the temple, he couldn't perform miracles. That's because when someone is born that way, the astral body of the person has to pass through what the ancient Nagas call the river of oblivion, forgetting everything happened in his past lives and forgetting all the knowledge to perform miracles. So that Jesus, the one that was born out of Virgin Mary, couldn't perform miracles. And he went to India and China and died in Japan. And um, he actually brought a lock of his brother's hair to to uh, Japan and uh, buried it uh, in a tomb next to his own tomb. Uh, people can check it out uh, and look it up. Christ, on the other hand, is actually an ET who came down to us, um, took out the body of Jesus made by the ETs, that resembled the appearance of Jesus. So at the same period of time, during that three-year period, there were two bodies, two beings, when Jesus, when Christ. So Christ's mission was to preach about uh, spirituality and love, and also he resurrected three days after, after being crucified on the cross, just to show people that there's life after death and there's reincarnation. But we all know the concept of reincarnation was later removed by uh, the Catholic Church Council meetings from the Bible. And Christ, because he was an ET being, he was able to remember all the um, knowledge to perform miracles. And this is why he was able to uh, resurrect the dead and to walk on water and to materialize objects like foods and, and bread. And, um, and actually the ETs from Theoba, they are able to do everything that Christ did on earth. They were able to. They are able to levitate. They are able to communicate through telepathy. They are able to materialize objects. They are able to um, 
to project illusions on people, like what they did to Michel de Marquet, making him think that there was going to be an accident when, in fact, it's just an illusion. And that can lead to some of the people who claim that they have uh, a special experience on a different planet, the super soldier experience or the uh, the other kind of experiences working for military um, special space programs. Uh, so I think uh, this book enlightens a lot of uh, people by giving them the knowledge, the information that they can really cross check and to and to verify and to do uh, additional investigations and to explain what's going on in our current world. Um, it talks about the, the purpose of life. This is actually exactly what the Christ preached when he was here. Um, life is about love, it's about learning different lessons. Because when we die, our physical body kind of is left here on earth to decay, to be degraded. But our astral body leaves the physical body, and there's going to be a life reveal process. We're going to reveal what's happened in our lifetime and how we did. Uh, we are going to be able to feel how other people felt when they did certain things onto others. So we evaluate ourselves. We, not God, but actually we are part of God and God is part of us. So we or God evaluates ourselves, how we did, and we decide what lessons to learn in the next lifetime or next reincarnation. So through each lifetime, we learn different lessons and we constantly evolve spiritually and to move up the ladder. And um, and I think um, it connects all the dots to me. And I don't know how you feel about that, but uh, to me, this book is probably the most interesting book that uh, I have ever read. Yes, I would agree, 100%. Um, and it is recommended that you read it about three times because your mind is seriously so blown away that you probably do miss things that when you go back through, you'll be able to get a more in-depth feel about it. Um, I, I'm just one of those people that, to say like I believe everything, I think that would be false, but if that is what you believe, I honor what you believe and my mind is open enough to sit and have a conversation with you and I wanna know why it feels believable to you and what it's done for you, and is it positive and healthy for your evolution? And I'm sure someone just getting into really questioning and becoming aware of, well, why am I here? What What is my purpose? What are the lessons I'm supposed to be doing? I'm sure, especially coming out of the framework of religious families, um, you could call it religious trauma if you wanted to, um, I do think that they would have difficulty in the beginning just because of the absolute um, warrior of Jesus thing that goes on in Christianity, especially evangelists and fundamentalists that are, you can't go against like this certain narrative. So, I mean, to say it's not for a beginner, I wouldn't say that. I'm just really glad that I have done a lot of research and I have a lot of interest in this topic so I'm able to go into it with an open mind and not be like oh this is bullshit oh that's bullshit that's impossible I don't ever want to be that cynical when I read somebody's material like that I want to live in a world of infinite possibility and this is a book that makes my belief in the infinite possibility stay true to me and I think that's the best way I can say it because again it's a feeling when you read the book where you just, you feel that there is so much truth to this and explain so much, but then it's also scary because there's a point where they're going and taking samples from other category one planets that have decided to basically use atomic bombs against each other because of the political divide, the divide in money, the divide in status, the hunger for materialism and limited spiritual evolution and ultimately since they kept fighting they blew the planet up 150 years later these extraterrestrials are now observing how are these planets going to come out of this and the humanoid race the best way that i could say it that is re-establishing they are um pretty gruesome characters to read about and look at or even imagine in your mind but it's also a really great warning because 
we all have atomic weapons now and a lot of the ET experiences that you've seen even on a map you can look at a map of all of the nuclear warheads in the world and those are also the highest sites of ET experience as well and I believe that that's them coming in and being like these idiots are about to blow themselves up which is why Earth being a category one planet makes absolute sense to me from this perspective. It makes sense to me with the age of Aquarius and the Zodiac. It makes sense to me for, um, there's a man called Hans Wilhelm. You can look him up on lifeexplained.com or YouTube. And he explains the vibrational levels that the earth has sunk down so low that we're literally about to just fall off the frequency structure like, um, I remember I was talking to a channeler a couple weeks ago that got a message during a quantum healing session, and one of the guides came through and said, the next Sodom and Gomorrah is Earth if you guys don't figure it out. That's all I have to say. And then the being walked out and walked away. And I was so grateful that the lady shared that to me because that adds on to my belief and my strings tying together for so many things. We're getting so many different warnings. And I think with the limited focal point that we as human beings have, especially when you're not on an evolutionary journey um, of what's out there, it's easy for you to blind your eyes and be like, oh no, this is not possible. That can't be possible. But when you think all eyes are technically on earth and all these other category one planets and the, the love that these higher vibed beings have for us coming back down and helping us, I really is think is something that is so far away from us because we're so used to conditional love and because in and out of history, we've been connected and disconnected from our source for so long. Would you agree? Yes. And I'm specifically and particularly interested in the lady who said that uh, if we don't change, then the next uh, Southern Gomorrah will be us. Because uh, this book talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I think it's important to elaborate on that. When you look at the, the past, uh, if you read the, the Jewish texts, which contain more uh, specific information about the two the people in the two cities, they were not just uh, behaving like, uh, it's not just because of sodomy that uh, the two cities were distracted. The people there were so evil and uh, not compassionate that they really punished the people who helped others. For example, a girl was trying to give money, uh, actually gave money to a beggar on the street, and they punished the girl. So they, they punished uh, the people, the kind-hearted people. And so this is uh, one of the reasons that they were distracted. They were just like cancer cells, uh, that contaminating and spreading to the people who were in contact with them. So if you have malignant tumors in your body, then uh, you really want to take them out and not to have them to spread around to your other parts of your body. So I think this is uh, something we need to pay attention to, especially nowadays that people are not uh, as focused on the spiritual development, not as compassionate as in the past. And we should also focus uh, more on having technology to assist in our spiritual development and not to enslave us in a more materialistic world which is temporary so as we see ai artificial intelligence and also some of the other uh, technology or, or developments and i i do see that um, in, in the future if we don't change our ways then uh, catastrophes are going to happen um, and I do believe that uh, we can change the future for the better. Because remember, in the book, it says even the Theobans cannot predict uh, more than 100 years in advance. They can predict what's going on, what's going to happen within 100 years. So that kind of means that there are still ways and room for us to, to mend our ways and to take their warning seriously so that we don't have to be like the two cities, uh, so then Gomorrah and uh, we can have a better world without the assistance of the ETs, because that's the best way to learn. Um, if you are served with the meal on a plate, then you just take the uh, the, the meal and, and you wouldn't learn as much, just like a parent trying to teach uh, a child a mathematical problem. The best way is to 
give the child basic principles and help the child to learn uh, how to solve the problem on his or her own and not to give him or her the answers directly. So we need to go through the struggling process to survive and to be able to fly like a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. Absolutely. Great analogy. I love it. Let's talk about effects of colors. So my favorite was the blue light story that I would love to talk about, the antimicrobial effects, and then I would also like to discuss the green light on migraines. But according to the book, what were some of the things that they were discussing about effects on color on the human race? Well, colors affect us uh, tremendously, mostly on the human energy fields level. So if we wear, for example, wearing green right now, because a lot of a lot of people say I have a green aura, so like a yellowish green kind of aura. They say that uh, if the colors match the colors of your aura, you're going to feel much better and it improves your uh, psyche or human energy field. So uh, green is also a color that has uh, therapeutic effects on migraines or headaches. And the study, clinical study uh, has proven that. And the participants in the study wanted to get the uh, LED green lights free of charge because they were so effective. So that shows how effective it is. But because, you know, when companies develop uh, this kind of uh, LED lights, they don't make a lot of money because uh, they can just be duplicated and manufactured elsewhere, like India, China, or Vietnam. So uh, the big pharma companies uh, won't be able to make a lot of money. They cannot patent it. So this is why uh, this such technologies haven't been uh, promoted uh, actively or uh, widespread uh, by the media. Um, so that's the green color. And the blue color, uh, Harvard Medical School uh, had a study that uh, shows that uh, certain wavelengths of uh, blue color have uh, antibacterial antiviral effects. Uh, this is the color that they used to disinfect, one of the colors they used to disinfect Michel de Marquet after he entered their spacecraft. They used a blue light and yellow light to disinfect him. And, uh, and right now, China, I know for sure, because my friend who read a book, The Uber Prophecy, developed this kind of uh, blue LED light that has shown to have antibacterial effect. And also um, by using that for 15 minutes, it also lowers um, blood pressure as well. So a lot of my friends have used it and say it's really effective and it reduces itchiness and reduces pain. And uh, it's just that uh, companies cannot make a lot of money out of it. Um, similarly, yellow light a few years ago, there's a study about yellow light having antibacterial effects. And um, the pink color, <laughs> the book specifically mentions about pink color being able to reduce muscle strength by 30% if someone watches green, uh, watches, watches the pink color for 15 minutes or so. So a football coach in the University of Iowa knew about this apparently, and he painted the locker rooms of the visiting teams into pink color, and he rarely lost a home game. So that's just, uh, this is the effect of different colors. But the most benef most uh, effects are on the human energy field. So if you are really into this, you can have an aura reader to take a look at your aura and to see what colors they are and match the colors with the colors of your clothes. Or you're going to feel much better and you're going to know that uh, by using colors, you can um, just stop eating uh, aspirin or with conventional drugs. And actually, uh, in the 20s, in the 1920s, uh, chromotherapy or color therapy was really popular in the US. Um, and there are a lot of books on color therapy. But uh, after the invention or discovery of uh, antibiotics, um, they were able to patent or patent the antibiotics. So big farmers decided to uh, get more profits uh, from antibiotics. So this also indicates that everything revolves around money. Absolutely. And I love that you keep reminding people that they, if they can't patent it, they're not going to help with it. Like they're always going to go something that's more profitable. And even 
like medications where you take a medication and then you have to get another medication for the side effect of that medication. And it continues to build and build and build and build and build. And I do think that people are waking up to that industry and understanding a lot of the things that are set in motion today in the world are not for the people. And I think one of the biggest warnings that I got in the book was they were like, technology should help assist in spiritual development, not oppress or control the masses. And the mindset that spirituality should be in the focal point of your mind in your life on top of your life lessons and not materialism. And they even gave an example of a man who works his whole life creates an immaculate amount of wealth and then he dies, where does all of that go? Even if it goes to his, his kids, how do you know that his kids and his grandkids won't squander it? And then their great, great grandkids just live in poverty after that, back to the beginning of where he was. So you have to wonder after that man passed, like what spiritual evolution was he actually able to gain or did all he just gain was the illusion of the physical world? Right, exactly. The accumulation of wealth is um, actually one of the things that people don't realize that uh, is probably not beneficial to our spiritual development. If you look at the studies done by people who study um, near-death experiences or past lives, not a single person after coming back from near-death experiences or, or past lives say that uh, they regret not uh, making such investment to profit. Uh, they always say that I regret not uh, helping my friend or my family members, not loving them enough. Uh, and they always uh, focus more on the spiritual aspects of um, what they did in their past lifetime or the current lifetime. So this indicates that when you pass this on, when you die, then you are going to realize the meaning of life. Everything will be shown to you. And you know the purpose of life is about uh, love and spiritual development. Because when God created every one of us, he inserted a tiny portion of himself to each of our astral bodies. Well, not our physical bodies, but our astral bodies. So we are connected to God, and God is part of us. So God wants to experience what we do in our lifetime uh, in order to gain this kind of um, uh, physical, to gain spiritual uh, evolvement or experience. So in a sense, um, I think the most important sentence in the Bible is the kingdom of God is within you. God experiences life through us, but only the positive experiences, spiritual experiences, are fed back to God or, or being sent back to God. So I think uh, this is, should be the focus of life. And, and people need to realize it's not uh, how much you accumulate you accumulate in this lifetime, uh, materially, but spiritually, how we engage others, how we respond to the challenges in our lifetime, how we help others, how we love others. So this is the most uh, valuable experience that we can gain in lifetimes. Profound stuff. Before we wrap up, I want to talk about the technology that they showed him that isn't on earth for the reasons that we discussed earlier and then the healing methods that they also recommended to us in humanity to reconnect ourselves. Yeah, some of the technologies include uh, traveling at a speed uh, a few times faster than the speed of light, uh, transubstantiation, like what we call teleportation, and uh, levitation, and also making water from thin air, like combining oxygen and hydrogen atoms into water molecules and doing the reverse, and also uh, making foods that uh, can release calories at different intervals so they can only, they can eat uh, um, like every two days or so and not to have uh, three or four meals a day. They have uh, a lot of different technologies such as uh, like using colors and also anti-gravitational technologies. And, and um, I think they're, they're just like Christ. They can, do, uh, they can do everything possible. Oh, by the way, they, they look uh, forever young, so they never age. They can regenerate their body tissues and organs just uh, using their mind. So Michelle de Marquette was so surprised that they all looked like in their 30s. 
and they're perfectly beautiful. And uh, so they look like women, but they're hermaphrodites, meaning they have uh, both male and female sexual organs. But they are like uh, so compassionate and so beautiful. And Michelle Derbe, okay, really didn't want to come back. And um, he wanted to go back there after he came back here. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, and the healing methods. So they can heal different older diseases we can name off. Um, I think uh, at the end, uh, Michelle de Marquis asked him that question, how to do what they what they can do. And they said uh, they require uh, meditation and concentration. So I did a lot of studies on that. So healers, he healers and, and also people who can perform um, kind of uh, psychic powers, they always try to meditate so that their brain wave goes into the alpha wave range. Um, this kind of uh, highly meditative um, state. And then they concentrate, um, focusing on what their intent to for the things to be like. For example, if you want to heal a person, you first meditate and then use your intention. You imagine um, how wonderful, how comfortable that person is feeling and, and the recovery of that person. You just use your imagination. But only in your subconscious mind when you are in a heavy meditative state. So that's a trick of healing and performing miracles. Uh, but you require, it requires a lot of practice and mind power. Um, and because we are living on a category of one planet, our higher self splits itself into nine different people. So we only have certain psychic powers because we only have certain, like one mass of the electrons of our higher self. The Theobans or Christ are able to perform uh, miracles because they come from a category nine planet. That means their higher self uh, doesn't split into nine different people. The higher self, all the electrons go to uh, one person. So that's why they have more electrons. They have more super psychic powers. So this is why it's for them, to them it's easier to perform miracles. And and I, I can elaborate a little bit more on that is because um, certain members or high degree members of the Illuminati or secret societies, they have psychic powers or supernatural abilities, but they try to do it through other means, having rituals. Uh, I know that because I translated a different book written in German uh, into English. Uh, this is the autobiography of the uh, former high degree chair of the Illuminati. So they try to get electrons or energy from a different person to themselves through very devious means. Uh, that's not uh, the right way to do that. And they're going to regret after they die because they can feel the pain of the other person. So, uh, but electrons do have powers. Uh, if we practice meditation, if we do a lot of uh, psychic practice, we are able to perform the miracles performed by Jesus or Christ. You also have a scholarship that you set up called A Better World. Would you like to talk to us about that and let us know where we can find you? Yes. Uh, the scholarship is called A Better World uh, Scholarship, um, and people can read the book and uh, write about the, the their thoughts about the book and how to improve the world uh, through uh, uh, technology and which increases the spiritual development of uh, the people in the world. It's a thousand dollar scholarship given every year and uh, the deadline is July 19th of every year and people can find more information on my website chinasona.org and you can find a scholarship there. Wonderful. Well, Samuel, Samuel, I appreciate you taking the time to pull these details apart with us. Anybody that's listening, if your mind is absolutely blown, you can find the book on Amazon, correct? Yes, on Amazon. And are there two, can you find it by the original or should you be looking for um, Dayuba Prophecy? Well, uh, they're actually the same, either Abduction to the Next Planet or Theoba Prophecy. Uh, the content is the same. It's just the titles are different. Perfect. 
Just want to clarify because I wanted to buy both books just in case. And did he write anything else after this that we should be looking out for to get as well? I saw that there were 12 volumes on Amazon, but they were a lot of just the um, other language translations I came across. Is there another book or two that he wrote? He wrote uh, two other books. So both are fictions or novels. One is called She and I, and the other is called Nature's Revenge. But those two books are nowhere near as enlightening as uh, this one, Theoba Prophecy. Well, we'll definitely focus on this one. Please get your copy and reach out to Samuel if you have any questions and definitely follow him and stay up to date on where he is speaking and all of the wonderful things going on in his life. And before we get out of here, my friends, I brought you another clip from Nightcap, or should I say, Vitality Exposed Performance Photography has brought you Sentimental from Nightcap. Go ahead and add these guys to your playlist and hey, even head on down to Austin, Texas to go check them out as well, okay? I love you guys and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye. This is the Hoosier Media Network, your home for podcasting.